Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to stand together and open up your Bibles with me to the book of Genesis chapter 12. It's the first book in the Bible. Genesis chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Today I really, just like every week, but especially today, I need you to listen carefully to this message. This is, this is the beginning of, uh, as you know, we've been dealing with revival. And God awakening us and shaking us up and having us to wake up, amen, to having a deep relationship with the Lord. And one of the things that are essential for this revival not only to take place but to stay in our lives is this very thing I'm going to talk to you about. So I'm going to ask you. Today, not to be texting anybody or sending little notes to the person right next to you. Those are fun things to do. I'll do them both. But I, you could do that later after service. Hallelujah. But I really want your total undivided attention to this subject. Because if we do this, listen carefully. If a church as a whole, first, second, and third service do this. And the other two services committed to where I'm about to talk to you about. If we do this. Not only are we going to see this revival that God has brought to a church go to a higher, deeper level, but we're going to see a, a, we're going to see a citywide transformation, amen, that we desperately need. How many are ready for a transformation to take place, amen? Now, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. The Bible says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, And from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you should be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who uh, I will curse. And then he says, and in you, all the, nation, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And he was talking about Jesus. Jesus, descendant of Abraham. So all the families of the earth were blessed. And look at verse 4. So Abraham went forth from the Lord as, had, as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Now Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haram. Abraham took Sarai his wife and Lot his nephew. And all their possessions which they have accumulated. And the persons which they had acquired to her in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they had came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now watch this. The Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I.E. on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And so Lord, we set up an altar right here, an altar of prayer To call upon you, oh Father God, through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you that you would open our eyes to the revelation of family altars. I pray that we will not just be hearers of the word, but doers. We want to do what you have asked us to do. Because in it, you say that then we will have success in you, Father. And there's no greater success than to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone says, Amen. You may be seated. Now listen carefully. I know for a fact that what I'm about to share with you is of the Lord. I know for a fact that if you implement this, the devil will try, try everything possible to stop you from what I'm about to share with you. He would, he would try to bring havoc. I know that for a fact. Because he knows that what I'm about to share with you, if you implement it, it will change your family. I'm just curious, how many of you, listen carefully, how many of you on a weekly basis, not when there's emergency and so forth, but you have a scheduled time on a weekly basis when you and your family get 
together to read the Bible, to pray, and to worship. Raise your hand. Okay. The rest of you don't feel bad. You say, why, Pastor? I'm going to tell you why. Because, number one, often we're not taught how to do that. When I got married and I was in my honeymoon, I knew that having a, when I mean family altar, it's a time, a devotional time together to spend time with the Lord and with each other. I knew that it was important. It was so important to me that I took my Bible and a whole bunch of books to my honeymoon. That's pretty crazy, right? But that tells you how intense I am about prayer. And how intense I am about the Bible. Because I knew that that's how it transformed my life. Spending time with God. Because you will become like the person that you spend the most time with. So be careful who you hang around with. And so, uh, I think it was the second day. I pull out the Bible. And I pull out my commentary. It's a commentary. It's a book that makes comments about the Bible. It goes by its right verse. And they give you their interpretation of what they believe the Bible says. So I pull it out. You know, boom, boom, boom. Put it in. You know, right on the bed. I say, okay, Elvia. We're going to study the Bible. We're going to have devotional time right now. But I, will, I did it so wrong. I, I was just so intrusive, so domineering about it. I was so um, uh, mistaken on how to go about it. That, uh, and also, I, I, I didn't consider how my wife learns. My wife learns by hearing and by watching. I learn by reading. I love to read. Reading, I, I read every day in my life. And I just, it's like, how many of you like to read? Let me see your hand. Mm. How many of you learn uh, by listening? Listening, okay. How many of you learn by watching? You like watching shows and you learn that way. Okay. So you see how everybody, you have different groups of people who learn in different ways. So what ended up happening was that nothing happened. So, there was no family altar. Now, there was personal altar. Me and Pasora pray. I pray every day. Uh, my goal right now is to get to two hours a day. That's my goal. I pray at least an hour. But my goal is to get to two hours. The busier I get, the more I need to pray. Martin Luther, the, the, the great uh, reformer who started the Protestant Reformation, said that. I never understood that. I was like, wait a second. If I'm more busy, I need more time. Uh, and, but what I learned is that the busier you are, the more pressures you have in life. And the more pressure in the outside, the more pressure I need from the inside to push the outside. From not allowing the outside to come in the inside. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? It's just like in the boat. When Jesus was in the boat, the boat was sinking. Water was coming in. It's just very symbolic how many times pressures and things in life try to come in, in the boat. But as long as you got Jesus in the boat, you know you're not going to sink. Can somebody say amen? amen? That's an extra sermon. I won't charge you for that one. But are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you? The average fam. Now, here's my second question. How many of you will love to have a family altar, a time when you get together as a family to pray, read your Bible, and to worship. Raise your hand. I want you to look around. Now, single people, I know you're telling me, but I live by myself, Pastor. I don't have a family. Yes, you do. You got the biggest family in the world. Are you joking? You may not have your biological family with you, but you have the biggest family in the world, and it's called the family of God. And you could get a couple of you together. You can even do this over the phone if you want, preferably together. You could do this with a small group before the cell group starts. If you're single, tell the other single ones in the group, say, let's get together and let's do this before it starts. And that's why I like small groups because it really resembles part of this. But I want you to listen to this. Abraham. Abraham. He went into the promised land. God told him, listen, I have a promise for you. God says, 
God says, I'm going to give you provision. I'm going to give you posterity. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you uh, prosperity. I'm going to give you purpose. I'm going to give you protection. I mean, I'm going to give you the blessing. We call it the blessing of Abraham. And out of you, the, really the salvation of the world will come through. And that was Jesus Christ. But what is the first thing that he does when he gets there? The first thing that he does and the, the thing that we have recorded is that he says, sets up a family altar. He sets up, a, a, he sets up an altar and the family worships and seeks the Lord. And the Bible tells us they began to call upon the name of the Lord. And what amazes me is wherever the family moved together, they didn't rely on the old altars. They moved and they set up another altar. Wherever they went, they were setting up altars. If you go to chapter 13, you'll find it again. Not only in chapter 12, verse 7 and 8, but also in chapter 13. Again, you see Abraham. As a matter of fact, and we'll talk about this in the upcoming weeks, his grandson did the same thing. Set up an altar to worship God as a family. Because what he understood was that every time he went to a place, he was contending for territory. Please listen to what I'm saying. The pl first place you're contending, and the contending means for young people, it's, it's a struggle. You're fighting. There's a fight going on. The Bible tells us there were Canaanites in the land. There were people there that they needed to be dispossessed. That means that they had to be moved out of the way so God could come and rule in that territory. And, and this is very symbolic of our own life. And the first place where God wants to, amen, have rulership is in our own life. You are the first altar. Your heart, your heart, my heart is an altar unto the Lord. And you have ground to claim. Starting with yourself, but then you go to your family. I was, I shared this with my son Joshua. And I, listen, I'm opening up my heart to you. Because I really want you to get this. I told him the other day, I said, Josh, I failed you in this one thing. And I want you, when you get married and you have children, I want you to do this one thing. I really want you to do this. I want you to have family altar. Because I did not do that. I did not. They're all grown up now. And I know, you know, my daughter, she has children right now. And I wish I would have. Well, how many here wish their parents would have done that? I was thinking about it. I bet you my mom and my dad will probably have never got a divorce. And they would pray together and spend time together. Because the family that prays together stays together. As a matter of fact, studies have shown that. Research has shown that. Yeah, we know this. But yet when we ask the question, how many would like to have family out there? Everybody raises their hand. But nobody does them. And I think... Part of it is that we don't know what to do. And so I want to spend time showing you how to do this because this is important. And, and, and I want you to listen to this because this is generational. We live in a generation today where the church in America has neglected the youth generation. They want to focus on adults and I'm going to tell you straight up why. Many of the pastors and clergy want to focus on adults because they see dollar signs. They said they're adults, they have a more income than teenagers. Teenagers normally don't work, and if they do, they work for minimum wage, if that. So they're looking at the dollar sign thinking, well, we need a certain amount of income to have a certain budget to, to be able to run this thing. This is why a lot of pastors don't like to come to the Bronx. Because they know that the Bronx is the poorest congressional district in America. Yet in the Bible, I see Jesus came for the poor. He says, I came to preach the gospel to the poor. James chapter 2, he says, have I not chosen the poor of this world? God chose the poor. So he could make them rich and blessing. Rich and spiritual. Spiritual blessings from above. And so what has happened and what I've seen for generation and things are getting worse is that we, we, kids are learning 
spiritual principle, there is no nation. Listen, let me put it this way. America has the best Bible teachers in the world, bar none. No, there is nobody even close to what Americans have in terms of teaching. Bible, stud, Bible teaching is, is par excellence. What you get in this church, the stuff that you get in this church and cell group and downstairs in the classes and all the level, is stuff that, listen, you will, I took when I was in Bible college. You could get that high over here. And, and so it's not for lack of knowledge. But what has happened is we have learned God's principle, but we have not taught how to bring in the presence of God to our children. So our children learn, have all this Bible knowledge, but they don't know what it is to be in the awesome presence of God. They don't know how to woo in the presence of God into their homes. So then they get married and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to have this time in the Lord. And so... What we end up doing, failure to have a family altars, result in spiritual toxic environment. And this is what we see in society today. You see, because this is what ended up happening. I want you to listen carefully. People cry for revival. God sends his spirit and the spirit of God moves. Three weeks later, maybe months later, after that, Dead. You're like, where is God's spirit went? Well, maybe God only wanted to come for a few weeks. Are you kidding? God wants to be with us. How many believe God wants to be with us? As a matter of fact, God is with us. But what he's not doing, he's not manifesting his awesome presence. Because trust me, when God shows up in his awesome presence, we will know. When God shows up with power, I'm telling you, you're going to feel overwhelmed with his glory. You can't help but to worship God. And we have tasted of that. We have eaten of that. But I'm telling you, we have not gotten to the buffet level yet. Of the glory of God. We have not. And I'm telling you, God has it for us. But here's what happened. If God were to send it, it will maintain because we got so many issues in our lives. We have so many fights. How many of you fight in your home? Raise your hand. The rest of you lie. Come on. Keep it real. How many of you fight in your home? Raise your hand. Okay. And all the real people say amen. Okay. We argue. We fight. We discuss. We get into all this stuff. Why? Because. And then the Holy Spirit gets quenched. So on Sunday, we're rocking the house. On Sunday, we're like, yeah. But by Friday, we're killing each other. So you come on Sunday to try to find healing. You find a, so it becomes like this vicious cycle. Rather than during the week, we get in touch with God in our personal altar. We get in touch with God with our family altar. So by the time we get here on Sunday, we're able to say, God, we're ready for the big stuff. And God will feel welcome. But when you got a church, Coming filled with offenses. It's amazing how much. And even Christians. They fight each other. They get jealous. They get competitive. They get offended. She looked at me this way. Or she didn't look at me at all. I don't like her dress. Her kid step on my kid. And all this crazy stuff. When God has said love one another. Because God only moves when there is love. You can have all the skill. You can have all the preaching ability. You can pray for the sick. You can have oratory and articulate whatever God has given you. You can preach your heart out. You can be the smartest person in this world. And you can do miracles. You can even sacrifice your body. But if you have no love, it profits nothing. God is not going to show up. Because God is love. And I don't know about you, but I want God to show up a new life. Come on, somebody shout unto the Lord. I am not going down. The day I die, 
I want to be able to look back a new life and said we had a revival that didn't stop and we had a revival that's still going on it's going to revival that is going to outlive every single one of us because we establish a dominion of the kingdom of God in our homes listen to what I'm saying First thing that you need to let me explain you what happens with the let me give you the big picture and I'm gonna spend the next five, six weeks giving you the details. What happens in a family out? What happens is do you have there's three main components, but there's a lot of other little things that make it happen. What you want to do is set up a time, you can start with one day, just one day, when you get together. And you're going to read the Bible together. Now, for all the Bible thumpers here, this is not time for you to preach. This is not also a time to say, uh, this is what you're supposed to do. So if you're having issues with your children, don't start reading that verse that says, children, obey your parents. <laughs> if... Uh, or you show up to Ephesians chapter 5 and you turn to your wife and you say, you see, honey, the Bible says submit. It says it more than one time, baby. Or she turns to you and she says, she goes, yeah, look what the Bible said. It says to love me like Jesus. Jesus died. Died for me, baby. Don't tell me you love me and you don't die to yourself. So, that's not what happens, okay? We should do a play just like that, right? <laughs> what not to do in a family altar. So, so, what happens is, look, I'm having a family time here together with you, so please listen, okay? So, what happens is, you open up the Bible, and you're going to go for 10 chapters, right? You're going to read 10 chapters together. It's a lot easier, I learned, when you have two people doing it. Number one, you're not doing all the reading. Number two, when you have somebody else, I don't know, it just, it just something happens there. I have a friend of mine, a pastor of young people in Times Square Church. I began to share this with him. And he told me, you know what? He said, God just put it in my heart to do this with my wife. Nobody had told him to start family altars. And... And so I, I gave him some of the details and so forth. But he said, you know what happened? When we got together and we began to go over the Bible, revelation knowledge started to come forth. I mean, we started to see things that we didn't see before. Because when two or more are gathered in my name, said Jesus. I will be there. It, it doesn't mean that he's not there when you're by yourself. What it means, I'm going to show up in a way that I don't show up than when you're by yourself. Because I'm about the body of Christ. So, you, you read 10 chapters together, but this is how, the way you do it. Whoever wants to start, if you have children, you do it together and you say, okay, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Who wants to go first? So, John says, okay, I'll read first. He reads the first chapter, and then you go, okay, what does that mean to you? Okay, you know, what I see is here. Everybody starts blessing each other through what they see in that scripture. And then you go to chapter 2, go to chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You might, you, might say, uh, you might say, well, that's a lot of chapters, Pastor. We can't handle that. Well, then go to five. He said, that's still a lot. Go to three. If you can't do three, then you'll be lazy. <laughs> so start, you know, with something. Something is better than nothing, right? So start with three. Three is good. Trinity. Hallelujah. <laughs> so you start with what you can handle, right? So... Then, then it's prayer time. And you ask each other, what are the prayer requests? You know, look, I have a friend in the church that's going through this. I have a, you know, uh, I have my cell group member is going through this. Or somebody in my job. As a matter of fact, this is what I want you to do. I want you, and we're going to give you a way of doing this. I want you to get other people. Get, ask all your friends. Hey, man, you got anything to, that you need me to pray about? Sure, Okay. You take their, I say, give me the information. I say, I'm going to start praying this with my family out through time. 
Because when God answers that prayer, two things are going to happen. You're going to come here to church and fill out a little form. We're going to have a little box in the back starting next week. And you're going to put it in there and we're going to share that testimony with everybody in church. So everybody's faith is pumped up. You, everybody in your family's faith is going to get pumped up. And that person's faith is going to get pumped up to the point that they're going to want to come to church. Can somebody say amen? It's the easiest evangelism in the world. It's when God answers prayer. <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. And then you have time of worship. Now, you don't have to do it in the order that I did. And you have a time to just worship God and just sing some songs. You could just honor God during that time and just worship Him. Now, today, I, wanted, I only have enough time to spot a point in point number one as to and I'm going to get heavy here as to what we do during this time that we spend with the Lord. By the way, those who are dating, you need to do this. I mean, really. As a matter of fact, if ladies or guys, if the person you're with is not willing to do this, guarantee that if they don't do it when they're trying to impress you, they're not going to do it when they get married. Okay, and you get to see what kind of a person you're dealing with spiritually. Full for time. Okay, so, uh, so the key. Listen, these family altars are key to maintain revival in church, and for revival fire to increase at a higher level. So the first thing that we do here, what do we do at Father The first thing that I want to focus on is this. You minister to the Lord. You say, what, Pastor? You mean I can minister to God? That's what the Bible says. You, you find that in, in Acts chapter 13. In Acts 13, the Bible says that Paul and Barnabas and the people were ministering unto the Lord. They were fasting, they were praying, they were worshiping God. They were ministering to Him. They were honoring Him. The difficulty that I find with many Christians today is that they run out of things to say. And the reason why they run out of things to say during worship and adoring God is because they don't know anything about the God that they sing about. And the only way that you're going to learn about God, the only way that when you worship, it means something. The only way when you start worshiping God, you're just not saying hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The only way that you're not just going to stop with just saying hallelujah is if you know who you're worshiping. It's like, it's like when you are dating, right? Or if you're dating, you really want to get to know that person. You, you know, I was reading the, King, uh, the Sons of Solomon. And when I was reading this relationship between King Solomon and his bride and then the wife and then became his wife throughout the story here. It's amazing how detailed he was and she was, they were about each other. Your nose looks like this. Your neck is like the ivory of blah, blah, blah. If you say that today, it wouldn't mean nothing. But, but today, if you, you come up with some other things, your hair is a soft ass. Oh, we need some romance going on here. Okay? Your eyes are as beautiful as the ocean or something. I don't know. Okay? And, 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 and so forth. So you, 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 but you can't talk about something you don't know. So what we do during worship, listen, we, 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 um, during this time of ministering to the Lord, we are, we are honoring God for his greatness and where he belongs in our lives. In Uganda, Uganda went through a horrible civil war. People were getting killed left and right. There were, the AIDS cases were up to 25% of the population of Uganda had HIV. I want you to think about that. One in four people. Imagine you have 100 people, 25 are HIV positive. The United Nations has said to them, this is what they said to them. 
If you don't get it together soon, your country is going to be basically decimated and it's going to go into worse chaos. The violence that was going on, they had a horrible uh, precedent at one point. And then you had civil war. And then you had all these smaller bandits or groups. And you've seen in the movies. Right? Like, uh, what was the name of that movie with the diamond? Uh, Blood Diamond. And you see the small groups trying to take over territory. Just like you see in other countries even right now. It was devastating. Women were getting raped left and right. People's arms were being cut off. Just to send a strong message. Recruiting little children to fight in the military. And I'm talking about eight years old. Traumatized. They were decimating families. Pastors and churches were hiding. But at one point they said enough is enough. We need God in this nation. The only solution to this nation is God. And let me tell you what they did. They started to do what I'm talking to you about right now. As a matter of fact, this is not original with me. Pastor Melinda and Pastor uh, Daniels of Florida. Pastor Melinda is from Uganda. He was one of the pastors involved with this. And I want to get credit where credit is due. And, and they share how it, the nation was totally decimated and they had to call upon God. They started to call upon God. And God began to show them that the family altar had been destroyed. They need to rebuild the family altar. And they began to pray together as family once again. And God began to turn things around and put a good precedent. And that precedent, all the pastors said to him through the, through the wife of the president. It started with a, a president's wife. Made a declaration that this nation was a nation that's going to be dedicated to the Lord. But then the pastors came back and said, no, we need also the, the president himself to do that. And to break the covenant that they had made with Muslim. Because they had declared that a Muslim country. And they said, no, no, we need the president. The one who's the covering of this nation and, and government. To declare that this is going to be a Christian nation. And he did before a stadium of, of Tens of thousands of people. It's on video. I've seen it. And he says, we're going to fulfill the purposes of God and I dedicate this nation to God. And so they did. They started getting rid of corrupted uh, politicians. We could do the same. Hallelujah. And began to clean house. They even made uh, a part of the, an agency in the government called Ethics and Integrity. Wow. They started allowing God back in. It's amazing. They're starting to put God back in. And here in America, we're trying to get God out. And so, so the nation began to change. Listen, listen to the results. As a result of that, they went from 25% HIV cases. They're now down to 5 6%. Can somebody praise the Lord? That's about a good time to say praise the Lord. That is um, so amazing that now all the countries are trying to go over there and figure out what is the factor. It's the Jesus factor. And it's that good elected officials are not going to, good police officers, now Christians started to get involved in different areas. Because now they had the spiritual fortitude, strength to now go out there and stop hiding behind the four walls of the church like we see here in America. And started bringing transformation to society. And now you see a whole nation being changed. You say, well, they got lucky. Or maybe they're not as busy as we are. Well, they're very busy, trust me. Sometimes people think because you have financial need that you're not busy. Sometimes you're busier trying to make uh, ends meet. Watch this. The people in Taiwan said, the Christians there, only 3% of Christians in Taiwan. Can you imagine a nation where 97 people out of 100 people that you meet, only them are Christians? I mean, they're not Christians? Here in this nation, is 78%. So the average person that you meet, they're going to classify themselves as Christian, you know, something related to Jesus. Let's put it that way. In that country, in Taiwan, they're very busy. So a matter of fact, they're probably busier than we are. And so the people in Taiwan asked this group from Uganda. They said, listen, can you come? And you were able to turn a nation that was in turmoil back to God. This nation, 
Only 3% of Christians, we need to do something. So they, they send people to teach them how to do family altars, to pray, to ask God for revival. And let me tell you what happened. In one year, they went from 3% Christian to 7% Christian. They had double the amount of Christian plus put a little bonus in there. That was another good time to praise the Lord. How many are glad for what God is doing in the nations? He is. And, and now, people who have revival and have a great movement of God, like South Korea, where they had, a, they had the biggest church in the world, 750,000 pastors chose church there in South Korea. Now the Koreans are asking the people in Taiwan, can you please come over here because we want some of that. Because now church did not become just something you do on Sunday. Now living for Christ is a lifestyle. Because when you take it home, whatever you do at home, that's what you're going to do outside of your home. You pray at home, you pray outside. You worship at home, you, pray, you worship outside. You read your Bible, you declare the Bible when you get out. Whatever you do at home, that's what you're going to do outside. And that's what they end up doing. And now we see this move of God. And I believe, and I'm getting here to a point. I believe this nation had two great spiritual awakenings. The, mo the, the most vibrant, resounding one was with Pastor and uh, Dr. Jonathan Edwards. One of my favorite ones. He was probably the smartest man that has ever lived in this nation. He was a genius. His books are not easy to read. Uh, but what a man of God. And evangelist Benjamin Warfare, who came from England. We love the British too. Hallelujah. And they both began to minister. The power of God was so strong that the, in whole towns, they closed down bars. People started going to bars. See, to me, bars and all that stuff, it's like church. It's the world's church. They do the same thing. They put music. We put worship, right? We have small groups. They're over there. They hang around in little groups, you know, by the bar, you know, hanging out, right? Uh, we get intoxicated by the Holy Ghost. They get intoxicated by alcohol. Hallelujah. They're just trying to get what we already got. The, the biggest difference is that ours is for free and they charge you in the other place. Can somebody say amen? Glory to God. This is the best deal in town. So watch this. So when, there was a great awakening. Jail started closing down. It was a great move of God. People would go to church. They would fall on their faces crying out to God for mercy. Lord, how can I sin? What a sinner I am. They were just crying out to the Lord God. Forgive us. There was a true brokenness from the heart. It wasn't just religion. And that's the thing that's killing us in this nation. It's just a whole bunch of religion. People just going through the motion. But it's not coming from the heart. It's not real. They're not filled with the power of God. They're not filled with the presence of God. God is not in their lives. It's just a religious thoughts. They're not close to God. They don't have that close relationship. And this is the kind of a thing that I believe that God will bring in our home. And it will change the spiritual climate of your home. Some of you right about now, you need to change your spiritual climate. And I'm going to tell you this. Please listen. I want to warn you. As soon as you begin to do this, the devil will try everything possible to shut it down. Because he knows that the moment you do this. You're gonna, your family is going to become armed and dangerous in the hands of God. The moment you begin to do this, your family will not be the same. And if your family is not the same, you see some of you are saying to me, I, I can almost hear you. you I, I can hear the whoa, whoa, whoa. Some of you say, but listen, pastor, my sons, my daughters, they don't want nothing to do with God. They might even be here listening right now. and They're just squirming in their chairs because they just can't wait to get home and watch the football game. DVR, my brother. DVR. Jesus first. This is the Lord's day. All right? Check this out. This is important. You might have a husband that's not following God. 
You might have a wife that is not following God, parent. How many of you have somebody, at least one person in your family, that is not following Jesus? Listen carefully. Listen, listen. I, I, there's more testimonies that I have time to share with you from all over the world when people, the family members decided and invited everybody, said, listen, every Tuesday night, for example, I'll have something. Listen, I'm going to 7 o'clock right here in the living room. They didn't, nobody showed up. They said, okay, I'm having it. And have the empty chairs, hallelujah, for each of the members. And have it every week and every week. But then, then came one son. And he got touched. And then came another daughter. He got touched. And finally the husband. Usually the husbands, right? We, we're the stubborn one. And he, he finally came. And then all of a sudden the whole family got transformed. And then the neighbor began to change. And the person upstairs began to change. And the whole neighborhood began to change. And transformation began to take place. And then the external families are starting to come to the Lord. Because the power... It's in the people that pray and get in touch with God and get the real thing, not the fake stuff. I'm talking about the real thing. Because you know when you got the real thing, people are going to change. So today, I know what your struggle is. When you minister to the Lord, let me bring it home here. I know when you begin to worship God, even when you come to church, I know this happens to you. It happens to me. What you go through, I'll go through the same stuff, probably worse, at a worse level. When I begin to pray, how many of you, when you begin to pray or to minister to the Lord, you're singing or whatever, all of a sudden you remember, how, you remember all this stuff that you were supposed to do. How many go through that? Okay. It's like, oh, I got to call that person. Oh, that person needs me. Oh, that email. Oh, that voicemail. Oh, my God, I forgot to call them back. I got to do my homework. Homework. Now, Jesus, you want me to do homework, right? Jesus will tell you, yes, I want you to do homework, but I first want you to minister to me before you minister to your studies. And so, you, you get all this noise. How many of you get noise in your head? I don't get I, 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 noise. You get a lot of noise, a lot of frequency. And what that is, is the enemy is coming against you. He wants to shut you down. And what you need to do is to push back. You got to push back. Now, the people in Brooklyn, anybody here from Brooklyn? Anybody from Brooklyn? Okay, we got Brooklyn in the house. People, people from Brooklyn will say something like this. If the devil were to come... And he says, I want you to do this. And I want you to get involved in this. Stop praying and worshiping. They probably will say something like this in the spirit. They will say, forget about it. People in the Bronx. How many of anybody here from the Bronx? People in the Bronx. We will turn to the devil. And we'll say, devil, shut up. In the name of Jesus. And if you think that's too harsh because you're too spiritually sensitive, I want you to look at what Jesus told them when he was talking to Peter. And he, Peter told him, hey, uh, Jesus, no, oh, what? You're going to die? Woo, no way, man. You're doing miracles, signs and wonders. Remember, we're supposed to be around you, the 12 thrones. Jesus, you're going to break the hookup right now. You don't need to die. He said, Right to the devil, so you can see, knew who was talking uh, through using Peter, put a thought, an intrusive thought in Peter's mind, and he said, Devil, get thee behind me. I think it's time for many of us, for all of us in this house, to get up and say to the devil, Devil, it's time for me to do some pushback. You don't belong here. The only one that belongs here is the Lord Jesus. For my thoughts are on the Lord. Can somebody say amen? Push back. Push back. Push somebody. Tell them push back. Come on. Push at least three people. Tell them push back. You got to push. You got to push. 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 You got to push back. And you got to press through the noise. Because let me tell you what happens. As you begin to worship God. I get noise. Listen, I, I'm here for three services. And I still hear noise by the time I get to the third service. 
And I'm here, and I, I, I see, listen, I, my mind, I go through a lot of stuff. The pastors are thinking a thousand things at, at the same time. What about this? What about that? What about this? Kick, 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 kick. But, a lot of noise. But this, this is what I learned. I learned that if you push back the noise, if you press through the noise, at one point, you're going to get focus, And you're going to experience the glory of God. And all that noise will be under your feet. And then you get to have an encounter with God right here in New Life Outreach International. Or in your home and with your family. And you just begin to worship. You get so lost in God. All of those problems. All of that anxiety. All of that depression. All of those fear. All of the insecurity. All of the doubt. All of the unbelief. Has to flee. Because you realize all of a sudden. God is bigger than my problem. God is bigger than my circumstance. God is bigger. Can somebody say it? Man, I wish I could preach to you. And the enemy will make you look at anything but the Lord. So talk to the Lord. Even talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. You talk to yourself all the time. You've been talking to yourself since you got here. Talk to yourself. And like the Bible, you see that in the song. The Bible says, bless the Lord. He's the, the, the song said, bless the Lord. Come on, Fernando, bless, bless. Bless his holy name. Bless. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, the Bible says. Why is my soul so downcast? Translation. Why I'm so depressed right now? He said, the psalmist said, why I'm so down? Why is my soul? Why I'm so dispirited? Why I'm so disappointed? And then he turns around and he says, change the channel. Hallelujah. He changed the channel. He says, I, I'm going to put my hope in God. Somebody here this morning needs to push back the noise and say, for now on when I worship and I minister to the Lord, it's all going to be about and if you believe that, give a clap offering to Jesus. I want everybody to stand together. I'm only gave you point number one today. And next week, ooh, you better get ready. You don't want to miss this week's.